Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On Saturday, March 7th of 1935, a woman's torso was discovered near Bells, Tennessee. Right away, the authorities knew they were going to have a hard time identifying this woman. The torso was badly decomposed, and it's 1935. The advanced forensic technology we have today didn't yet exist. But some people had a sneaking suspicion they knew exactly who this torso belonged to. About two months earlier, a set of legs had been found, but not in Tennessee. These legs were found about five hours south in Laurel, Mississippi, and they belonged to 57-year-old Mrs. Daisy Keaton. So the Tennessee authorities called the Mississippi authorities. And they got a hold of Jones County Attorney Jack Devers, who was covering the notorious leg scandal of Laurel, Mississippi. He knew Daisy's case better than anyone. The Tennessee authorities described their recently found torso in detail, explaining that this might be a portion of Daisy Keaton's body that someone had disposed of way up north in Tennessee. Devers immediately knew that this wasn't the same woman. The body types were too different. Plus, even though Mississippi papers kept calling Daisy's case the legs murder and the legs scandal, they hadn't actually found a pair of legs. Rather, it was a pair of upper thighs and the lower torso of a woman. Anatomically, Devers knew this Tennessee torso and the Mississippi upper thighs and lower torso just couldn't be the same two people. The parts didn't match up correctly. But still, news travels fast, even when it's wrong, and numerous papers reported that this mysterious Tennessee torso might belong to Daisy. It didn't. The remaining portions of Daisy's body Her head, arms, upper torso, lower legs, and feet were never found. And depending on who you believe, the rest of Daisy's remains probably couldn't be found. Welcome to episode 199, Daisy Keaton, The Legs Scandal. If you're wondering, it's probable that the woman whose torso was found in Tennessee remained unidentified. There were no additional news reports about her case after it was established that she was not Daisy Keaton. Sarah Daisy McKinstry was born in August of 1877 to parents George and Laura in Jasper, Mississippi. Some accounts indicate that Daisy was actually born in 1879, not 1877. It's unclear which year is correct. The two-year discrepancy might be a clerical error on some government records. But it was pretty common for women in the late 1800s and early 1900s to blatantly lie about their birth year, even on government records. You know how it was and is for women. To be younger is to be better, or at least that's what the patriarchy keeps telling us. Even Daisy's tombstone has a different number entirely, 1897. In 1935, one of her sisters would explain to journalists that Daisy's age was a mystery even to her family. When pressed, the sister guessed that Daisy was about 57 years old. If we do some quick math, that means Daisy was born in 1877. So that's what we're sticking with. Daisy was the second oldest out of eight children, but in 1880, her older sister Mary died at age five. Daisy was three. And without Mary, Daisy became the eldest child. That same year that Mary passed, in 1880, Daisy gained a younger brother named Newman. Then came Agnes in 1882 and Eloise in 1885. Andrew arrived in 1889. Then George Jr. was born in 1893. And then last but not least was Laura, named after her mother. She was born in 1906. Daisy was 29 years old at the time of Laura's birth. In May of 1906, the same year Laura was born, 29-year-old Daisy was also sued by the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company. They were suing because Daisy had collected, or was about to collect, $12,000 on her husband's life insurance policy. Daisy's husband was John Monroe Keaton of Jasper, Mississippi. John was born in April of 1870, and after building a successful career as a businessman who sometimes worked in the railroad industry, he died on October 3rd, 1907, at age 37. Somehow, John had been thrown from a moving train and he had died instantly upon impact at the McNeil, Mississippi train station. The situation surrounding John's death was odd. 
In the insurance claim that Daisy had plans to collect on, John's death was framed as an accident. But the insurance company had questions. Like how could this experienced man fall accidentally from a moving train? John also had plans to move about 80 miles south to Angie, Louisiana, but Daisy and the kids were going to live in Laurel, Mississippi. Could John's death have been a suicide, not an accident? And the insurance policy had only been taken out a year before his death. None of these questions were resolved, and honestly, the answers to them might have been innocent. Maybe the business John had in the railroad industry had nothing to do with trains themselves. He could have worked in accounting. Maybe John's family planned to follow him to Angie, Louisiana. Maybe the insurance policy had been taken out at just the right time by sheer luck. But Daisy didn't show up to the trial when she was supposed to. So by default, the courts ruled in favor of the insurance company. There's no documentation that Daisy paid back her $12,000, which is more than $370,000 in today's money. But she must have. After all, she was legally obligated to. Or maybe she hadn't received the sum yet. This part of the story is lost to history, probably because Daisy didn't show up to the trial. When John died in 1907, he and Daisy had been married for about 12 years. They had both grown up in Jasper and married around 1895 when John was 25 and Daisy was about 18. They had their first child, Maud K. Keaton, in 1896, a year after they were wed. Then came Juanita May Keaton, who went by Weta, in October of 1898. After that was John Earl Cotton Keaton, who went by Earl in March of 1902, and then it was John M. Keaton in 1903. Unfortunately, John M. passed away in 1904 when he was only one year old. Three years later, in 1907, John Sr. died. And that same year, Daisy gave birth to her fourth and final child, Mary Eloise Keaton. She would go by Eloise. Following the death of Daisy's husband, she did not remarry, and she maintained her married name of Mrs. Keaton. With Daisy at the helm of the Keaton family, they kept their status and renown in the community. Everyone in Laurel, Mississippi and surrounding areas knew who the Keatons were, especially after the papers caught wind of a young man who sued Daisy Keaton for alienation of affection concerning her youngest daughter, Eloise. On September 28th of 1925, a man named Rayburn Alec Robinson, who was 25 years old, asked 18-year-old Eloise Keaton to marry him. They had met two years earlier in 1923 at a street show. At the time, Eloise was only 16 years old, and she knew her mother Daisy would never approve of Rayburn, though it's never explained why. Maybe Eloise was just too young. Regardless, 23-year-old Rayburn and 16-year-old Eloise began a secret relationship, Rayburn passing letters through Eloise's friends. This went on for two years. Daisy had no clue that her teenage daughter was in a very serious, very committed relationship with a man, an older man that Daisy had never met, to boot. So on that September day in 1925, Daisy was flabbergasted to learn that her precious Eloise and some random guy had gotten engaged. Daisy immediately spoke to her daughter, 28-year-old Weta Keaton. And Weta immediately called the police and county clerk to see if a marriage license had already been obtained. She wanted to know more about the illicit couple. Who was this Rayburn person? And when were he and Eloise getting married? Weta also asked her 59-year-old boss, W.M. Carter, to help with the situation. Weta was a stenographer and bookkeeper for Carter's Lumber Company. And Carter was more than just Weta's boss. He was also a close friend of the Keaton family. Some called him their advisor. Weta had found out that Eloise and Rayburn were set to marry in a little town called Ellisville. It was only eight miles south of Laurel. So Weta asked Carter to drive to Ellisville and see what he could uncover. Upon arriving, Carter checked out the town's marriage records. The situation was far worse than Daisy or Weta thought. Turns out, Eloise and Rayburn were not just engaged as of September 28, 1925. They were already married. After Daisy learned of her daughter's elopement, she demanded that her son Earl drive her to the local sheriff's office. From there, Daisy and the sheriff went to Ellisville themselves. They talked to anyone and everyone who had been present during the nuptials, including the Justice of the Peace who had performed the ceremony. Just when Daisy thought things couldn't get any worse, she learned that the newlyweds were already well on their way to Chicago. 
they had taken a train, one that would stop in Birmingham, Alabama. So Daisy and the Laurel Chief of Police sent a telegram to Birmingham's Chief of Police. In the telegram, Daisy requested that the train be searched and that Rayburn be charged with perjury and marrying a girl underage. Daisy was hoping to intercept Eloise and Rayburn before they made it all the way to Chicago. But by the time the telegram had gotten to Birmingham, their train was long gone. But the train was going to make another stop, this time in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Daisy sent yet another telegram. Luckily, this one made it to Chattanooga in time. Eloise and Rayburn were removed from the train and detained by police. Meanwhile, Daisy hopped on the first train to Chattanooga. She arrived there the next day. According to court documents, the meeting of Daisy, her daughter Eloise, and her new son-in-law Rayburn was stormy. No details were given, but Daisy must have prevailed because Eloise left Chattanooga with her mother and they returned to Laurel. Meanwhile, Rayburn continued to Chicago. And just a few days later, Eloise and Rayburn's marriage was annulled. In total, the couple had been husband and wife for three days. Less than a month later, on October 6, 1925, Rayburn filed a lawsuit against Daisy and the Keatons. He wanted $200,000. That's nearly $3.5 million in today's money for the alienation of the affections of his wife and for being falsely arrested. Alienation of affection laws, sometimes known as homewrecker laws, are a civil court matter. They allow the spouse to sue another person for, quote, purposefully interfering with the marital relationship. But the person sued is usually the person a spouse cheated with, not the spouse's mother, although I suppose that's obviously possible. This whole thing sounds bizarre and definitely old-timey, and it was some juicy gossip for the small town of Laurel. About a year later, in November of 1926, the case had already been settled and appealed. It was determined that Daisy, and not the entire Keaton family, was the only person held responsible for alienating Eloise's feelings and causing Rayburn's false arrest. As a result, Daisy was ordered to pay $9,500 to Rayburn, a far cry from the initial request of $200,000. But still, it's about $164,000 in 2003 money. But there's no indication that Daisy ever paid Rayburn. Instead, she gifted all of her assets to her daughter, Weta. I'm not certain about the legal ramifications of that action in 1926 Mississippi, but it seemed to work out okay for Daisy. It doesn't appear that she was sent to jail or anything because of it. Nine years later, in 1935, the fiasco between Eloise and Rayburn was long past. Eventually, Rayburn would remarry and move to Louisiana, then Illinois. And Eloise would remarry as well. Her second wedding was set for February 2nd, 1935. But days before Eloise's big day, tragedy struck. Her mother Daisy was missing and likely dead. From 1931 to 1934, Earl Cotton Keaton, his wife and their daughter, lived in the Keaton family home with Daisy and Weta. And that suited the mother-daughter pair just fine even though Weta was known as a rather high-maintenance person. According to Weta's aunt, Paula Reichheimer, the young woman was a bit weird. Paula recalled that Weta would have Christmas gifts delivered to herself. Then she would pretend they were from her boyfriend, who did not exist. These gifts included expensive items, candy, roses, and more. Paula said that Weta was also known for keeping baby clothes in her dresser, despite not having a baby. She said Weta was dreaming. And sometimes, Weta would throw tantrums. She would spend weeks in her room pouting. The Keaton family would have to deliver her meals to her bedroom because Weta refused to come to the dining room. Paula remarked that Weta was moody and spoiled. But maybe she just didn't get along with Weta. She also complained about Weta looking in the mirror too often. So it's safe to say that Paula was quick to criticize her niece. But again, with all this juicy gossip, Despite any off-putting childhood behaviors, Weta and her mother Daisy were described as being very close. As a child, Weta actually preferred hanging out with her mother more than other kids. And as an adult, Weta and her mom were seen around town together all the time. And they had plans to open a hotel together in New Orleans. Weta had even taken a hotel management course in Washington, D.C. to prepare for their new business venture. That way, they could use Daisy's money to fund the business and Weta could run it. 
Even though Daisy was considered wealthy by those in Laurel, Mississippi, it seems that Weta still controlled most, if not all, of Daisy's financial assets. She had ever since Daisy had signed them over to her in the wake of Rayburn's lawsuit. But by January of 1935, the statute of limitations on Rayburn's case had run out. And Daisy wanted to regain control of her money. She was tired of having to confer with Weta every time she wanted to write a check. But nobody in the Keaton family expected the transfer of funds to be an issue. Weta was a devoted daughter. She would do anything for Daisy. But even though Weta appeared to be doing well financially thanks to her mother's money, she was having a hard time personally holding down a job. Like I said before, Weta used to work as a secretary for lumber businessman W.M. Carter, but she left that job two years earlier. Now she mostly worked as a cashier at a filling station that her brother-in-law, David McRae, owned. But Weta was probably just biding her time until her and Daisy's New Orleans hotel premiered. On the afternoon of Saturday, January 19th, Weta worked a shift at David's gas station. Sometime that day, she also visited her aunt, Paula Reichheimer, for about an hour. Throughout the course of this Saturday, when people asked Weta about her mother's well-being, she explained that Daisy was traveling. She had taken a trip to New Orleans. That's where Daisy's youngest, Eloise, lived. According to Weta, Daisy would be back in a week. But Daisy never made it back. On Monday, January 21st, 1935, a rabbit hunter from Laurel was walking near a remote road north of Sandersville. The hunter's name was Dan Evans Jr., and Dan's dogs had noticed something odd on this isolated rural road, a sugar sack filled with something. Upon closer inspection, Dan realized that the something inside the sugar sack wasn't sugar at all. It was human remains, but not all of the human remains, just the upper legs and lower torso of a white woman. Right away, Dan contacted the authorities, and right away, rumors ran wild. The public quickly became suspicious that Daisy was not in New Orleans at all. And when members of the Keaton family were able to identify a specific mole that Daisy had on these legs, it became widely understood that 57-year-old Sarah Daisy Keaton was probably dead. But Daisy's death wasn't official. After all, a lot of people have moles on their legs. Some of them are even in similar places. There really was no 100% accurate way of knowing that these were the legs of Daisy Keaton. So the police had their investigative work cut out for them. First, the detectives searched the area where the dismembered legs had been discarded, but they didn't find any relevant evidence. They did locate one witness who said there was a strange car on the same road where the legs were found, just hours before the hunter discovered them. Another person made a similar report indicating that they had seen a red car. And yet another person said that around that same time, they saw a person throw two packages from a bridge into Tallahalla Creek. But for undisclosed reasons, the police discredited that third report and didn't search the creek. According to the sheriff's office, as reported by the Sun Herald, some members of the Keaton family expressed that a relative might have killed Daisy. During my research, I got the sense that Daisy had a big personality, one that sometimes clashed with her family. For example, Daisy and her son-in-law, David McRae, weren't on speaking terms for a long time. Eventually, the police found a man named W.E. Kennedy, and Kennedy told the officers that on the same Monday that the legs were discovered, he had been in that exact area. He was driving along Highway 11 going from Quitman, Mississippi to Laurel, Mississippi. And a little before 9 a.m., as Kennedy approached Laurel, he spotted Weta Keaton walking on the side of the road. Kennedy remembered that Weta was wearing a dress and a fur coat, but no stockings or hat. This struck Kennedy as odd. It was a cold and rainy January day. Not the right weather to wear an expensive fur coat, and certainly not the right weather to forget your stockings or hat. When Weta signaled for Kennedy to pull over, he did. And then she explained to Kennedy that her maroon car had gotten stuck a little ways away. She told Kennedy that she was trying to get to her friend's house. She was going to stay there a while while her mother was away in New Orleans. Kennedy didn't think anything of it. He was happy to help Weta get to her destination. He drove her for about half a mile and then dropped her at a crossroads near her house. Later that Monday, Weta called a mechanic to help dislodge her car. It had been stuck in some swampland near Sandersville Road. 
very close to where the dismembered legs would be found that same day. On Friday, January 25th, it had been four days since the rabbit hunter, Dan, had come across the package of legs. And on this day, the police visited the Keaton home, where only one Keaton was left, 36-year-old Weta Mae Keaton. When Weta answered the door at about 9 a.m., the authorities asked to speak to her mother. But Weta said that would be impossible. According to her, Daisy had left for New Orleans that Tuesday, which was a strange thing for her to say, especially since she had told people on Saturday that her mother was already in New Orleans. And she said something similar to Kennedy on Monday. But apparently, Weta had driven Daisy to the train station herself on Tuesday. And Weta told the officers she had even received a letter from Daisy just that morning. But when the police asked to see this letter from Daisy, Weta couldn't find it anywhere. With Weta's permission, the police officers proceeded to search the Keaton home. Her brother Earl accompanied them. Earl didn't mind helping the police. He wanted to know where his mother was. And he, like many in Laurel, already suspected that Daisy was dead. In the Keaton home, the detectives discovered traces of blood. Later, forensics experts would determine that this was likely human blood. There were blood spatters in Daisy's bedroom and a bathroom, and portions of the bathroom had been recently repainted. The officials also identified a mysterious sticky substance on Weta's car. As the chief of police talked to Weta about this substance, she tried to rub it away. And that's when the officers asked Weta to go with them to the district attorney's office. There are mixed reports as to whether Weta was considered arrested at this point. She hadn't been charged with anything yet, but it's clear the police knew she was hiding something. After the police took Weta into custody, they questioned her for 20 hours. According to the Sun-Herald, there were no breaks for Weta. Later, it would be revealed that Weta was not offered any opportunity to eat, drink, or rest during this prolonged period of interrogation. And maybe that's the reason why Weta told so many different versions of events. At first, Weta claimed that her mother was in New Orleans. Then she said her mother had been held at gunpoint by an older woman. Then two different men, who may or may not have been in cahoots with the older woman, kidnapped her mother. This second story, as you can probably tell, made no sense. And so the officers continued pressing Weta for the truth. And eventually, this is the supposed truth that Weta landed on. She confessed that yes, She had hidden her mother's dismembered legs in a sugar sack on a rural road. But she hadn't killed her mother. Another person had. And that person was none other than her former boss and family friend, 67-year-old W.M. Carter. William Madison Carter was born on May 23, 1867, to parents James and Marianne in Bartow, Georgia. He was the oldest of seven children. And depending on what you believe about Daisy's confession... Carter might have been an additional victim in this ordeal. William Madison was named after his grandfather, William, who died in 1845. We're not entirely sure what William Madison went by himself, as all the local newspapers simply called him W.M. Carter. But we'll refer to him as Carter for clarity and brevity. In 1889, 21-year-old Carter married a girl named Nettie Newton. She was 20 years old. Their ceremony took place in Nettie's hometown of Belleville, Alabama. Carter and Nettie had four children, Mary Lou, Pauline, Helen, and Charles. Unfortunately, 19-year-old Mary Lou passed away after an illness. By the time of her funeral, the Carters had moved from Alabama to Mississippi, so Mary Lou was buried in the Hickory Grove Cemetery of Laurel, Mississippi. Eventually, Carter and his wife Nettie would be buried there as well. In Laurel, Carter made his name as a lumber supply businessman. He had been in the lumber and sawmill industry since 1892, and he had opened up his own wholesale company near Laurel around 1907 when he was about 40 years old. But even before that, Carter was doing really well financially. He owned two nice houses, supported his wife and kids, and was generally recognized as a rich man. Sometime between 1916 and 1920, Weta Keaton was hired as Carter's secretary. She would have been between 18 and 22 years old. Weta was responsible for collecting bills from his clients, 
transcribing notes, and managing the office. About a year into their working relationship, Rita and Carter began a secret romantic relationship. The deals of this affair are largely unknown. Rita would later claim that she and Carter were frequently intimate. But Carter, who did admit that he and Rita had feelings for each other, said nothing sexual ever happened. But sex or no sex, it was undeniable that Carter visited Rita at her home a lot, so often that the people of Laurel noticed. But these meetings between Rita and Carter at the Keaton home were always on the up and up. Rita's mom, Daisy, was always there to chaperone, and nothing unsavory seemed to happen. Carter just became known as a friend of the Keatons and Weta's mentor. He had experience in banking and finances, so he could have been offering Daisy and Weta advice on their upcoming hotel venture. On June 25, 1933, Carter's wife, 63-year-old Nettie, died in Laurel, Mississippi. Nettie was buried, as I mentioned before, near her daughter in the Hickory Grove Cemetery. And around this time in 1933, Weta quit working for Carter. The reason that Weta quit working for Carter is heavily debated. It may have been because her physical health was deteriorating. That same year in 1933, Weta began to experience horrible back, shoulder, and neck pain. She attributed this chronic pain to a severe injury she had sustained as a six-year-old child. And Weta's family reported that when she was in pain, she paid no attention to what was said and had a faraway look in her eyes. And at the same time that Weta quit working for Carter, she seemed to be experiencing mental health issues. And seemingly, out of nowhere, she lost about 40 pounds and began acting oddly. According to one of Daisy's sister's testimony, Weta was unusually bright mentally and a good conversationalist. But starting in 1933, she would seem to try to avoid us, have little to say, and appear restless and nervous. She would turn pages in magazines, running through them rapidly without reading a line. Her eyes had a wild, starey look. Weta's brother Earl noticed that something was amiss with her too. He said she just wasn't the same person. According to Weta, she quit working for Carter because his advances had become much more heavy-handed since his wife had passed. And there does seem to be some evidence that this was true. Weta's sister-in-law, Mrs. Earl Keaton, remembered that Carter was at the Keaton home far more after his wife died. And Weta's sister-in-law would have known since she had lived with Weta and Daisy for several years. According to Weta, Carter was persistent. On multiple occasions, he tried to get Weta to run away with him. On Saturday, January 19th, just two days before Daisy's legs would be found, Carter tried yet again to win over Weta. While she was working her shift at the gas station, Carter asked that she go with him on a trip to Mobile, Alabama, the next day. But Weta said no, for many reasons, I'm sure. One of the main ones being that, according to Weta, she was engaged to an attorney from Washington, D.C. He was referred to in the newspapers as Mr. Grace. Weta had met Mr. Grace while attending that hotel management course she took two years ago, back in 1933. At the time that we'd met Mr. Grace, she had already quit working her job as a secretary and was no longer in Carter's employ. According to court records, Weta's mother, Daisy, begged Carter to stop pursuing Weta romantically. It was even one of the reasons that she let Weta go across country to take that hotel management course. Daisy wanted Weta out from under Carter's thumb. But as reported by the Clarion Ledger, Carter continued sending Weta letter after letter after letter even while she was in D.C. Now let's jump to January 26th of 1935. Weta was speaking to the police, who had figured out she was lying about her mother traveling to New Orleans. And after Weta realized the authorities weren't buying her tall tales, she revealed to them what she said was the actual truth. Late at night on Saturday, January 19th of 1935, Carter went to the Keaton home. He was there to see Weta. Then... According to Weta, Carter attacked her mother, Daisy, out of nowhere. There was no buildup or heated argument. Carter just struck Daisy with an iron fireplace poker repeatedly until she fell to the floor. Then, Weta said that Carter continued beating Daisy with the poker, bashing it into her head again and again. The only reason Weta had for Carter's alleged actions was that he wanted himself and Daisy to have more privileges. 
I am assuming this was a euphemism for sex. And based on the reporting of these events, the general masses had no clue either. Then, Weta said that Carter drove off with Daisy's body. That same night, he returned with Daisy's upper legs and lower torso bundled into a sugar sack. He wanted Weta to hide them. So the next day, Weta drove her maroon sedan with the partial remains of her mother in her passenger seat. She dropped the remains on a deserted road and left. And that was when her car became stuck and Kennedy had to help her get back to town. According to this version of events, Weta had no idea what Carter had done with the rest of her mother's body. And also, according to Weta, Carter had told her to tell the police that kidnapping story. Weta said she had to because Carter had threatened her life. Weta would later claim that this confession was coerced, but that argument would not hold up in court and Weta's confession would be considered as is. After Daisy had been murdered late Saturday or early Sunday and disposed of on Monday, Weta spent several nights at her Aunt Paula Reichheimer's house. She would be there Tuesday through Thursday night, but it would appear that Weta returned to the Keaton home, the site of her mother's murder, during the daytime. On Friday, January 25th and Saturday, January 26th, a crowd of people had gathered outside of the jail where Weta was in police custody. The whole ordeal was big news. The Keatons were considered local celebrities. And it didn't take long for folks to put two and two together. A mother was missing and a daughter was in jail. Somehow, Weta was involved in Daisy's demise. On June 28, 1935, Weta was charged with murdering and dismembering her mother. Around this time, Weta was allegedly over her talking to her sister Eloise. She said, They are accusing me of killing mother. You know I didn't do it. That same day, 67-year-old William Madison Carter was arrested. He was held at a jail in Jackson, Mississippi. He had been charged with murder in connection with the slaying, and the only evidence against him was Weta's confession, which Carter vehemently denied. After Carter's arrest, they searched his car for any remnants of Daisy, and they did find a few strands of hair, but these weren't brought up during trial, so they probably didn't match Daisy. Still, Weta's confession and Carter's arrest had motivated the authorities to find the rest of Daisy's body. The police knew that would make convicting these two murderers so much easier. After all, without a body, the prosecution has to take on the burden of proving there was a crime. And that extra argumentation can derail even the most focused jury. For days, the police were positive that they were going to find the rest of Daisy's body. Based on Weta's confession, Carter couldn't have hidden Daisy's remains very far away. He had to have left the Keaton home, gotten to his home, cut up the body, and hidden the pieces in just a few hours. There's no way he could have gotten far. There wasn't time. But days and days passed, and still the rest of Daisy was not discovered. They sent 50 incarcerated men to comb the swampy woods where Daisy's legs were found, and they searched nearby bodies of water but it seemed like Daisy was quite literally gone. On February 1st, the Sun-Herald reported that police were no longer positive that they could find Daisy's body, and they never did. During Weta's trial, the most likely reason as to why they couldn't find Daisy would be revealed. But before her trial, a lot happened. Carter steadfastly denied that he had any part in Daisy's death, and Weta's mental health took a turn for the worse. While in jail, she entered a catatonic stupor. She wouldn't speak. She hardly ate. And it didn't seem like Weta had the capability to understand her surroundings. As a result, she was transferred from the jail to a hospital. Her doctor was especially passionate about transferring Weta to the hospital because the concrete and steel jail cell couldn't be heated well. Just a few days later, on February 2nd, Weta's little sister, Eloise, married a man named Jack Anderson. Jack was a handsome young fellow who served on the Laurel Police Force. We're not sure when Eloise and Jack began their relationship, but we do know that Eloise returned to Laurel from New Orleans at the news of her mother's likely death in late January. Eloise was part of the reason why Weta's first story of Daisy went to New Orleans was debunked. Eloise was quick to say that her mother had never told her she was coming to New Orleans. And it seems like if you had a daughter there, you would let her know you were on your way. 
Perhaps their wedding was always planned for February, or perhaps Eloise and Jack just hit things off very quickly. After all, this would be 28-year-old Eloise's third marriage. After she married Rayburn for three days in 1925, she had next married an aviator named James Daniels in the early 1930s, but they had ended up divorcing. It could have been that Eloise was tired of wasting time on the wrong men, but who knows? Regardless, Eloise and Jack tried to keep the wedding a secret from the citizens of Laurel. But you know how small towns are. Word got out, and everyone was critical of this small country wedding. It was even brought up in court. How could the Keaton family celebrate Eloise's nuptials so soon after their matriarch had been slain and butchered? On February 11th, Weta was moved from the hospital to the jail. It had been ordered by the county attorney, Jack Devers. I wonder if he thought Weta was faking her mental health episodes, or if he thought the jail is too cold was a poor excuse. It was clear many others believed that. Two days later, on February 13th, Weta filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. The argument was that she was being wrongly imprisoned since Daisy's death hadn't been officially proven. That's weird coming from a woman who confessed her part in her mother's death. But okay, Weta. The following day on February 14th, Weta was reported by the Sun Sentinel to be in a serious condition. When Weta was indicted four days later, she had a nervous breakdown due to severe mental exhaustion. After that, the authorities moved Weta back to the hospital. She couldn't make the walk from the jailhouse doors to the ambulance, so they had to put her on a stretcher and carry her out. Meanwhile, Weta's lawyers were probably panicking. They openly told journalists that they were struggling to get FaceTime with Weta. She was in no state to talk about her mother's murder. Her mental health would not allow it. When they did try to ask Weta questions about Daisy, she was unintelligible. And as you can imagine, it's incredibly difficult for a defense attorney to do their job when they can't communicate with their client. And Weta wasn't communicating with anybody. She had gone completely mute. Everyone in town was fascinated by this phenomenon. They even had to move Weta's hospital room to the second floor because over 40 townspeople tried peering into the windows of Weta's original first floor room. On February 20th, Weta Keaton didn't respond when the judge asked her what her plea was going to be. After an awkward silence, her lawyers entered it as not guilty. Weta's attorneys had not been able to speak with her about the case yet due to her severe mental health issues. Weta couldn't even walk. She was being transported to and from all court proceedings in a wheelchair and accompanied by a dedicated nurse. The next day, on February 21st, W.M. Carter entered a plea of not guilty. The Greenwood Commonwealth paper indicated that he looked physically worn by the stress of the situation. His trial would begin after Weta's. Weta's trial began on February 27th, 1935 and the public spectacle surrounding the event was crazy. There were 500 seats in the courtroom, and every single one of them was taken. People wouldn't leave during the lunch break for fear that they would lose their seat. At one point, the balcony seating area was so overloaded with spectators that the platform dipped about 11 inches. Still, the people wouldn't leave. The judge had to order the evacuation of about 200 people in the balcony. They were willing to risk a balcony collapse and potentially serious injuries just to see Weta Keaton's trial. The prosecution prepared 60 witnesses and was seeking the death penalty. Their entire case was predicated on one simple, permeating argument, that Weta Keaton was a liar. Not only had she lied about her mother traveling to New Orleans, but she had also lied in her confession, and she might even be lying about her mental state. According to Weta's confession, Carter had killed Daisy with an iron poker and disposed of the majority of the body elsewhere. Carter had, theoretically, only left Weta with the upper thighs and lower torso, which Weta took to that country road in a sugar sack. But the available evidence indicated that most of Daisy Keaton's body had never left her home. During the investigation, the authorities had found that the Keaton family fireplace had recently been cleaned and repainted, Remnants of the cleaning powder could be seen, and the paint was barely dry. And despite someone's best cleaning efforts, there was still incriminating material left behind. Small white bone fragments were in the fireplace, along with greasy stains near the front portions of the fireplace. Experts testified that these stains 
could have been caused by the fats of a human body being burned. A pair of Weta's gray silk stockings were also collected from the Keaton house. These stockings had some odd, bad-smelling stains on them. Experts told the court that these stains were probably undigested vegetable matter from Daisy's stomach. In the Keaton backyard, they found more bone shards and a portion of a woman's hat. Additionally, the prosecution presented witness upon witness who testified that there was a horrific odor coming from the Keaton house between Sunday, January 20th and Tuesday, January 22nd. Neighbors said it smelled like an awful combination of burning hair, rubber, and leather. And to put the final nail in the coffin, the investigators had even found a murder weapon. It was a pistol that had been hidden in between clothes in Weta's closet. It could hold six bullets. When the authorities found the gun, three of those bullets had already been shot. There was evidence that these shots had happened at extremely close range, as if someone had pressed the muzzle directly into someone's skin. And wouldn't you know it, numerous neighbors of the Keatons testified to hearing three muffled gunshots on the same night that Daisy was likely killed. Based on this information, the state presented the following scenario. Someone, probably Weta, had shot 57-year-old Daisy Keaton while she lay sleeping in her bed. Saturday night or early Sunday morning, they dragged her body to the bathroom, dismembered her, and burned most of her remains in the fireplace. Yes, the iron fireplace poker that Weta said Carter used to bludgeon her mother to death did have blood on it. But the prosecution contended that it was for a different reason. They said that Weta had used the poker to tend the fire in which her mother's remains were burning. The state didn't take a clear stance on whether or not they felt Carter was involved in Daisy's murder. But they made it undeniably clear that Weta was far more involved than she let on and that she was absolutely guilty for her role in Daisy's murder. The state also didn't present a possible motive, but I think she had a pretty big one, since Daisy had recently asked Weta to transfer her financial assets back to her. And there's always the added wrinkle that Weta and W.M. Carter were or had been involved. In response to all this, Weta's defense tried to prove that she was legally insane. They brought in six daughters to testify to Weta's insanity. And across the board, all six doctors believed Weta wasn't in her right mind. Here are the statements from each doctor. J.D. Smith said, she's insane. J.B. Jarvis said, I considered her insane the first time I saw her and she's quite insane now. A.J. Carter said, she was insane when I brought her to the hospital. Robert T. McLaurin, she's insane. Joe Green said, this girl has been suffering from some kind of dementia procox which means early onset dementia. And finally, R.H. Cranford, she's insane. But the prosecution was prepared for this argument. They said that Weta was acting very differently when she was all by herself than she was out here in the courtroom. During the trial, Weta was nearly comatose. She sat in her wheelchair and stared at the ceiling. Nothing fazed her, not even when they brought out her own mother's legs and lower torso to be submitted into evidence. She did not move or react at all. Sometime following this trial, Daisy's partial remains were buried in the McNeil Cemetery. So it must have been jarring for the jury to hear Weta's personal guard testify that she behaved very differently when alone. She could feed herself. She even paid her bills. The prosecution demonstrated that Weta had written multiple checks since she had been admitted to the hospital after her arrest. Later, outside of the courtroom, Weta slapped the guard for his testimony. Keep in mind, this is not a question of, is Weta's mental health okay? Because her mental health wasn't okay. That was obviously clear. But the question the court needed to answer was, was Weta legally insane at the time she committed these violent crimes? It would change her sentencing significantly. It was the difference between life in prison and life in a mental institution. And even though both places aren't ideal, one is far worse than the other. By the end of the proceedings, the state had painted Weta as a fiendish person who killed her mother in cold blood and then burned her body for several days. Meanwhile, the defense painted Weta as a woman out of her mind. On March 12, 1935, after a night of deliberation, the jury found 37-year-old Weta Mae Keaton guilty as charged. She was sentenced to life in prison. Weta immediately moved for a retrial, but it was denied only two days later. 
So, Weta began preparing for W.M. Carter's trial, because even though she hadn't testified at her own trial, she was going to at his. But how could that be? Wasn't Weta unable to communicate? Well, it turns out Weta was able to talk again. In fact, by March 26th, only a few weeks after her own verdict, she was speaking just fine. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. Carter's trial began a few months later on May 24th, 1935. Once again, the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. And once again, the trial was a madhouse. There were hundreds of people who came to watch Weta testify. And actually, Weta's testimony was the bulk of the prosecution's case against Carter. But her testimony was different than her original confession. Now she agreed with the prosecution's assessment of the case as it was presented at her trial. Carter hadn't beaten Daisy to death with a fireplace poker. He had shot her. And where before, Weta had claimed that Carter had taken away Daisy's body to dispose of it, now she said she couldn't remember what happened next. As soon as Carter shot her mother, her memory went blank until the following Wednesday. That's when Carter appeared at her home requesting $10,000 for undisclosed reasons. Carter's defense team was able to provide an alibi for him, except for the few hours in which Daisy Keaton had been killed on Saturday night or early Sunday morning, specifically from midnight to about 5.30 a.m. And that's because Carter was, according to his lawyers, alone in bed. His daughter-in-law, who was living with him at the time, did testify that she heard Carter getting up in the night. She explained to the court that she was awake after drinking a Coca-Cola and two cups of coffee very late the day before. But since she hadn't actually laid eyes on him, it was hard to know for certain that Carter was in his home when he said he was. The defense also presented the testimony of a witness named C.L. Griffin. Griffin was a private night watchman who had heard two women in the Keaton home arguing on the night of the murder. One woman said, I didn't do it. And another replied angrily, I know you did. The first woman said, don't accuse me or I'll knock the hell out of you. Then Griffin heard three gunshots. It would have been after midnight and before 1 a.m. I'll be honest, based on what we know here, I'm pretty convinced that Carter had nothing to do with Daisy's murder. But the jury felt otherwise. On June 7th of 1935, after at least eight hours of deliberation, 68-year-old William Madison Carter was convicted of murdering Daisy Keaton. Carter immediately requested a retrial, but it was denied. Then he appealed his case. And this appeal was successful. If you're a true crime fan, you know that's pretty rare. A year later, in March of 1936, the state Supreme Court reversed Carter's conviction and sentence. The Supreme Court believed Carter had an alibi, and they established that the state would need better evidence against him to retry him. So the prosecution tracked down Weta again. They wanted her to testify at Carter's second trial. Since Carter's first trial, Weta had also appealed her case. She said that her confession was coerced and that her mental health was not taken into account properly. But that appeal was denied in April of 1936, and the court's original decision for her case was upheld. But now, Weta was in a mental health facility. The jury had sentenced her to life in prison. But the prison medical team felt that Weta was better suited somewhere else. Somewhere that would cater to her mental health needs. And in May of 1936, Weta was officially declared insane. She was admitted to the state asylum at Whitfield. The prosecution still asked Weta to testify at Carter's second trial, but she refused. Weta claimed that she didn't remember anything about her mother's murder, so she wouldn't be able to further implicate Carter. In February of 1937, a judge said to Weta, if you can't testify, of course we can't try it. To which she replied, if I knew what I said was true, all right, but I don't know it. And the only honest thing I could do is tell you I don't know. As a result, W.M. Carter was never retried. Carter died on January 21st, 1949 at age 81 in Jones, Mississippi. He was buried in Laurel. His health had been failing for about three years, according to his obituary. He continued running his lumber supply company well into his 70s. He had six grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Weta Mae Keaton died on November 11, 1973, at age 75, in the mental institution at Whitfield. She was buried in McNeil, Mississippi. 
She had outlived all of the other Keaton siblings, and at some point, the Keaton family home had been destroyed. I don't know about you, but I found this case fascinating. If I had been a local in Laurel during that time, I probably would have been keeping a scrapbook of newspaper articles to collect all the gossip of the Keaton family saga even before Daisy went missing. I probably would have been on that balcony that was about to collapse at Weta's trial. And I would love to know if that night watchman was right, because I bet Daisy was confronting her daughter about something, and that's how this all started. It adds another layer of mystery to this old case. If you like these antique cases like I do, make sure you listen to episode 131, The Alabama Axe Murderess. It reminds me of Weta's case a lot. These mysterious old cases are a good way to end spooky season. Happy Halloween. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank, with additional writing by me. As usual, all editorial comments are my own. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Schecksneider of Southern Gothic and me, Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. It's the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I don't accept suggestions on social media private messaging. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fried, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review. I'm on all large platforms like iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.